welcome to Genesis Volatility Podcast. I'm here with Tom Sosnoff. He has a 20-year trading career at the CBOE. He's the co-founder of Thicker Swim, as well as the co-founder and CEO of Tasty Trade. Tom, how are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's a very exciting one for us. So I was thinking we could talk about a few things. We talk about your career at the CBOE, how, how, how you got started in trading. From there, we'll talk briefly on Thicker Swim, and then we could jump into Tasty Trade. Sure. Nothing's off limits. Go wherever you want. All Perfect. Right. So maybe if uh, for people who don't know you yet, how did you get started in, in trading? Um, I am a I'm, I'm baby boomer. So when I got out of college, there were no jobs because interest rates were 20%. I got an interview in New York City on Wall Street. I was a political science major, so I was thought I was going to be you know, doing something in who knows where, in politics or whatever. Uh, but uh, I got a job on Wall Street. I got an interview on Wall Street. They offered me a job. I took it because I had no other offers. And I've been in the business ever since. That's awesome. So last time I had heard in your bio, you started at Drexel Burningham for about six months. Drexel Burnham. Yeah. Drexel Burnham. And then went off to the CBOE yeah. and were there for about 20 years. Is that yeah, right? That's right. So when you were at the CBOE, were you at the same firm the whole time? or No, I was I was a prop. You were a prop. Okay. Yeah, so I was, I was a market maker working for myself. Got it. So even on day one, or how did that start on day one? Day one, well, these guys I met at Drexel, um, they were like a little older and married, and they wanted to, they didn't really want to be at Drexel. They wanted to go off on their own and trade, but they needed somebody to go to Chicago to, to, to do the option part for them. And I was like 23, so I'm like, I'll go. You know, like, they, they offered me some money to trade with, and, and I had never even been like, west of the East River in New York and um, so I just packed up my car and uh, quit my job packed up my car and went to Chicago because the trading floor was really cool like 1980 1981 um, and as soon as I walked out I was like this place is great but then they they lost all their money in 30 days oh, they had 50 grand they lost it all and I hadn't even made a trade I made one little tiny trade I think I was up $18 and uh, they lost all their money. So now I was in Chicago, no money and no job, and I had to figure it out. Interesting, so, okay, so you're- So I borrowed, I raised some money, yes. you know. Back then, people would like take a shot with like young kids, you know, like they'd take a shot, some, kid, some guy took a shot with me. So another guy on the, on the floor who's already a trader says, okay, I see potential in you, Here, here's some money. I don't even know if you saw potential. I think at that time, they're just like, they, they're making so much money, you know, like some people are making so much money, they're like, uh, fine, fuck it, I'll take a shot, you know, that's all. That makes sense. And yeah. then you're ta you say, you know, you're doing mar market making. Yeah. Also, I'm sure you're doing some directional bets sometimes. Is it one of those things where it's well, a little bit mixed all, with the two? We, I was a pure market maker. So on the SIBO, okay, um, on the SIBO, you can't, you could only, you either were a market maker or a broker. You couldn't be both. Got it. You have to either represent a customer or represent yourself. So I was a market maker for 20 years. I traded the S&P 100 primarily for 20 years. Um, and uh, so, you know, yeah, I took a lot of shots. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you saw some pretty interesting markets. We had a 1987 crash. I was there. Yep, 2000, we have the tech bubble. You were I was there. there. So what, what kind of lessons did you learn in 87 and 2000? Were those, you know, big moments for you or were those kind of things that you saw from a distance? How, how was that? Oh, no, no, 87, I was in the pit all day. I was like one of the only 20, 30 people that lasted to the end of the day. It was scary, it was really scary. We were scared shitless on um, you know, in 1987, um, lots of stories. I made money that day, but not enough to make it worthwhile, hmm. you know? Um, and I wasn't really sure what was going on and I wasn't sure what to do. You know, like I was, I wasn't scared. I just was, it was a weird day. Like I, I was more concerned that all the money I had made over the last six years was going to be gone because the clearing firm was going to go to business. Yeah. So I was more worried that Continental Bank was going down than I was worried about myself. That makes a lot of sense. Because, you know, like, it was a license to steal, but I was more worried that all the money I'd made over the prior six years was going to be was gonna be gone. Yeah, things are breaking. The I thought the clearing firm was going out of business. Yeah. Clearing firms are like, they hold your money. Yeah, that's pretty scary, so, for sure. That's what I thought. And in 2000, it's kind of a different environment, but it's still, uh, still like a, a very... 2000 sucked. 2000 um, sucked. Yeah, it sucked. It was, it was like, it was a dot-com boom. So we were index traders. So the dot-com boom was, wasn't really a boom for index traders because the indexes didn't really do anything. The Nasdaq did, but we traded S&Ps. So the S&Ps were kind of like, we were in the boring spot and everything else was crazy. Mm. Um, 
the down move was good, but in 1999, we started to build Thinkorswim while we were kind of wrapping up trading on the floor. So we were kind of like stretched thin to building a business. We, we had, by 1999, I'd worked for 18 years. And whatever money I saved with, with a partner, my Scott Sheridan, we, we pulled it together and we decided we're going to build thicker sum. We didn't even know what that meant. Mm -hmm. We just took all the money we made. We didn't even tell our wives. And we decided we're going to go build this company. And, and we weren't exactly sure we were building, but we were because we never built technology before. So we were in the process of going through all that and spending all the money that we'd made in the prior 20 years. And we, um, so we were also trading, you know, through that whole crash. And, building up toss. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. So your, your trade is 2000, 2000.com bubble. There's like a lot of tech stuff being built. It's probably kind of the inspiration of... It was hard to find developers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was really hard. We, we, we struggled. Um, we found a really good CTO in Chicago. He's still our CTO today. Um, but we couldn't find developers. We went... We basically um, hung out at programming competitions for like genius kids and then just tried to scarf them. Yes. And we eventually, we eventually found a bunch of Russian kids that were about 18 years old and we made a deal with them in 1999 and we, they, they were among the best developers in the world at the time. They, they came in second place in the IBM Programming Olympics. They were like all super geniuses. And we formed a friendship and we formed a partnership and we started with four kids in an unheated garage in St. Petersburg. We smuggled Sun Microsystem servers in their baggage back to St. Petersburg because we couldn't buy anything there. And today they are one of the largest fintech dev firms in the world with 900 developers. Wow, so that same small group that helped build four guys. Whoa, yeah. and now yeah. they're a dev shop with 900 people. 900. All over the world. That's amazing. And you guys still have a strong relationship? We still use them. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we're all buddies. That's great. I do want to jump into some Thinkorswim stuff, but right before we do that, I have a couple more questions on the trading sure. floor. So one of the things that I hear you talk about and I hear a lot of other successful traders talk about is sort of the, the variance premium and, and looking at sort of option implied volatility versus realized volatility, quantifying sort of that edge. How, how did you first discover that? Is that something you did on your own? Is that Did you have a mentor? Yeah. No, no mentors. Nobody helped you with anything. And we really didn't understand. Until 1987, there was no skew. Mm. So, like, it, it, if you had something was at the money, you know, if you were $10 away, it was, the price was the exact same. It's amazing. It didn't matter. So, calls and puts. And we were indexes, so there was no put skew, right? So, everything was, everything was priced exactly the same. So, but the hard part was that, you know, there was 400, 500 guys in the pit, and it was really crowded and really busy. And it was just getting to the era of like, you know, there wasn't really computers yet. There was kind of some handheld devices, but nothing was automated. And so you were doing everything in your head and it was all fractions, no decimals. Oh yeah. So we were doing between 30 seconds, 16th, eighth quarters, halves, you know, and trying to do all these multi-legged things with fractions going backwards in our head and trying to be the first person on every ticket. You know, so it was insane, kind of in that sense. So Valskew did not come into play. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, so I've heard this urban legend, and may, maybe you can confirm it or not, but uh, Nassim Taleb, apparently he had made his money buying that Valskew, and then the 87 crash is how he made all his money. Is that, have you heard that story? I've only heard he was a blown out trader. Oh, interesting. I heard he lost all, I heard he tried to, lost all his money oh, and was, um, and was a complete bust out, and oh. that's why he's a teacher. Oh, interesting. He, he's a really interesting guy, but he's kind of a dick, and he is, um, I, I shouldn't say, I don't know him personally, I just think he's kind of a dick. But um, what bothers me about him is that he preaches, basically, to buy, you know, the whole fooled by randomness thing is all about buying, you know, um, is, is, is about buying tail risk, essentially. Yeah. And it's absolutely the most idiotic way for an individual to trade. I mean, it's impossible to make money. You'll 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 die a, a a fast death, a slow death, whatever it is. You can't make money that way as an individual investor. Like you can't. It in the world we live in today, if if it can't quantify it, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. You know. So so I actually think he's really brilliant when I listen to him. But at the same time, I know that he never made a dime trading. That's super interesting. Never a chance yeah. he ever made a dime. 
And kind of to your point about buying vol versus selling vol, like if we look at the- Well, it, just remember, as a market maker, you don't have the option mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. buying vol versus selling vol. You're, you're, as a market maker, you're, you're taking the other side of every order regardless. So, so if it's not like you get to say, oh, um, um, $8 bid, and then you don't give an offer. Like somebody says, it, remember, it's all open outcry back then. So if a broker said, you know, let's just say, you know, par puts, you know, Augie par puts, whatever it is. And you don't know whether they're buying or selling. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially, you know, it's just about speed. You want to be the first person. So you're like, so you're like, you know, you're eight bid at a, at eight and eight, let's say. You don't know if you're buying or selling. Mm -hmm. So there's no buying vol or selling vol. You're doing whatever the opposite, you know, your edge is, is in whatever the bid ask differential is. So there is no choice to buy or sell vol. Yeah, totally. I just mean outside of the market making context. Like, as but there is reason. nothing outside of market making context. Like, because traders don't trade with other traders. I it's just like, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying there, there's nothing you can't really do what you want to do back then because today it's all electronics. You can do whatever yes. you want. You don't know who the counterparty is. But back then, if I go to you to make a trade, you're like, get out of here. <laughs> right, right. I just mean like uh, today, if I'm a retail trader and I'm thinking about buying vol oh, sure. versus selling vol, yeah. looking at these VXX or uh, these VIX ETPs, yeah. if you go on a 10 year chart, you just see this thing cons consistently sure. grind down. So yeah. to your point, selling selling vol seems to be a lot more. Well, the different, you can't look at a, a vol graph like that because, you know, that's you know that's the, the obvious play is to, hey, we'll just sell vol in you know, one of those. But you you would have been blown out a couple times, you know, yes. depending on timing. But um, but vol volatility on volatility is much higher than any of the index products we trade, and there is no way to really, you know, um, I mean, there's no way to stay long volatility just because of the cost to carry when it's in contango. Yeah, that makes so there's sense. nothing you can do. Yeah, absolutely. It's not even a trade, really. I mean, we going back into the. I would say mid '80s, and towards 1987, 1989, in that range, we saw an opportunity where we thought, "Hey, we can buy index vol mm -hmm. and sell equity vol mm. if we can get filled." And there's like you know a 20 point differential, so why aren't we doing this? But we couldn't execute. The, we couldn't execute the basket to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, people trade that strategy as like a implied correlation is that kind of a yeah, it's just a vol it's a vol differential strategy you know relative vol type of thing yeah 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 got yeah. it very cool um and then kind of just a couple more topics here so one of the things that you guys had going on as a program and at thinkorswim is you could close out your positions for for a nickel commission for you yeah and so you know this is a question that people will ask is that you know tail risk nowadays when they're skew priced in theoretically that's sort of the most expensive vol um, why isn't it a strategy just to sell those tinies? Why is it good practice to you know, close out that nickel risk? Well, first of all, they never come in until the end because nobody can afford to sell them. So, mm -hmm. so they don't come in. So they're, they're always a nickel. Or they're always, and what we wanted people to do was one, take off some of that. Listen, when we did it, there was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting around one day and we were all bullshitting. We said, hey, you know what? Let's do something nobody else has done. Let's let you buy back anything you want for a nickel. Remember, op option commissions at that time were like, Two ninety-five or a dollar fifty, whatever, with a ticket charge. No ticket charge, a nickel. You can buy back anything you want, and that way you don't have to hold junky options. Yeah, you know. So, so people love that. Um, and one, like I said, they never come in. So they never, you know, they're always something because nobody wants to yeah, sell. Yeah, right. And and two, it you know, we're in the business of freeing up capital so you can do something else. That was the whole reason. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it's like not not an efficient use to hold on. No, and there's actually no math. The, the, the interesting thing is, ten years later, we did all the research, started to do all the research at Tasty on that, and there is no math model that supports that as an optimal approach. Interesting, cool. And one last question, sort of on this training career. So, you know, spending twenty years at the Cibo, yeah. that's a long career. So, what would you say is like your biggest strength that helped you be a successful trader on the floor? Well, you get, you, you know. There are no floors anymore. Okay, so just you know, it really doesn't exist. There is still a small little you know SIBO floor, but it's tiny. But back then, it, um, it, everybody was almost the exact same personality. Mm. Like it wasn't like you were any different than the person standing next to you or than that next. It was just a bunch of 
misfits that were some were really smart some were incredibly stupid some were incredibly obnoxious some were really nice but in the end it was just it was a bunch of misfit alpha alpha males that you know that basically figured out how to survive and and you got to remember that 95 percent of the people that came through there didn't you know it was a revolving door but the, the survivors all lasted forever because you figured it out and so I think it's just more of, you know, a survival kind of, you know, it's almost a survival instinct or, or you figure out how to survive in that business. Yeah. And, you know, and I got lucky. I figured it out early in my career. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So then now, now it's 1999, building Thinkorswim. Yeah. You got a team in St. Petersburg. Just helping well, you yeah, we, we were small in Chicago. We, only, we started the firm with seven guys. Seven guys. Okay. Yeah. And, and how many people when uh, you exited Thinkorswim? 500. 500. Whoa. So... One of the things that I've learned myself as a trader versus sort of a business owner is a different mindset. So in trading, I feel like I'm, I'm very rewarded for being patient, picking spots. In the business world, I'm either like dying or I'm moving forward. Did, is there a difference in mindset that, that you have found building Thinkorswim versus being a trader? Um, well, there, it's obviously a very, it's a different domain, but the, the, uh, the foundation of all successes is is always about you know um, taking as much risk as you can in 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 some being able to assess it probabilistically and then taking as much risk as you can every chance you get so one of the reasons we were successful you know we built two billion dollar companies in over a 20 year period that's pretty hard to do mm. and one of the reasons we were able to do it is we just took a ridiculous amount of risk but not like not like insane risk, but just, just we took a lot of risk when we felt that it was a good play, you yeah. know, probabilistically, that which is sense. hard to explain, but you have to be able to assess that. And, we, and the other piece that I think is the key to really good um, entrepreneurship or business success is you have to make ridiculously fast decisions. Whether or not you're right or wrong doesn't matter. Just make the quickest decision. The person that makes the quickest decision is always the most successful. That's interesting. Is that like a grabbing market share, being fast, fast yeah. in the market? Like, why no, is that? It's always quick decision making because because if you, anytime you delay, somebody else is going to kind of grab the opportunity. And um, uh, we found that every chance we had to take risk, we took it. And every decision that we could possibly make that pointed us to take more risk, we took it. Mm -hmm. And like, we were completely the opposite of like, risk aversion or anything like that and we did it on it was a totally intentional because we just believed that fast decision making from our floor trading days was the key to success yeah that makes sense risk pays i like that so how did uh, think or swim end up being bought by td ameritrade what was that sort of transition? so there was a market meltdown in there was a market meltdown so so actually we sold we sold think or swim first um, we merged with a company that was public called Invest Tools in 2006 or something for like, so we kind of sold it for like 400 million and then, or something like that. And then, and then, but then we got it back because we kind of shut down Invest Tools and then built, mm. you know, took Thinkorswim back as the primary. And then, and then during the meltdown of 2008, 2009, they hit all the financial stocks pretty bad. They crushed them. Like our stock went from, you know, fifteen dollars down to like six dollars, whatever. Just like all the other financial stocks. And yet our business was going up. And so there were three companies bidding for us in the middle of the financial crisis. And and Scott and I lost control of the board because we so we don't want to sell, but we lost control of the board because our we just didn't have enough shares between the two of us to because of dilution, this the prior sale and stuff. So we were the largest shareholders but we didn't control the board anymore. Mm. So we didn't fight it, and um, we had three cash bids, or three bids for the company, all from from big companies, and we chose TD Ameritrade because we thought their stock was the cheapest at the time, and we wanted their stock. I see. So, so a good story is the the Ricketts. So the you know I don't know if you know the Ricketts tried. No. The, the, Joe Ricketts was this the guy that started TD Ameritrade. Okay. Tom Ricketts now runs the Cubs. Um, but at the time, the, the Ricketts kids wanted to buy the Cubs. But Joe, who's the father, was the largest shareholder at TD and wanted to buy Thinkorswim. But the Ricketts needed cash to buy the Cubs from the Tribune. TD Meritrade had, had 
they wanted to do the deal all in cash, but we wanted all stock. So we were arguing over the like how to do the deal. So ended up, the Cubs needed they needed cash to buy the Cubs. So um, so they sold stock to TD. TD gave the stock to us. So we did a three-way trade nice. between the Cubs, Thinkorswim, and TD Meritrade. So we ended up selling Thinkorswim to TD Meritrade for part cash, part stock. We got what we wanted. They got what they wanted. We got the cheap stock, you know, and then. Um, and then I stayed on for two years and I went to the CEO of TD Veritrade after two years and I, I was friends with him. We're still friends today. And I was like, his name is Fred. And I was like, Fred, you, you know, man, I, I like, you know, I, 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 I like everything about this company. I love you. You know, we're, we're good buddies, but I can't work here. You know, it's not my thing. I want to start another company. He goes, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do like, um, I want to build, uh, a financial media company to compete with CNBC and Bloomberg and whatever. And he goes, and I go, so I want you to let me out of my contract. And if you want to be partners with me, I'll let TD be partners. So he said, done, I'll let you out. We'll be partners. They put up, they'll put up some money. I put up some money. We matched in the middle. It's like $20 million. And, um, uh, and then we built tasty. That's fantastic. So what was the draw initially to a media company? Is it well, first of all, I couldn't build another brokerage at the time. That makes sense. Because I just sold them brokerage, so yeah. I didn't want to do that. And the other thing was, since I'd already built a brokerage, I, I wanted to do something different. And I really couldn't stand financial media in its current form. I thought CNBC was horrible, Bloomberg was horrible, you know, Reuters horrible, and Wall Street Journal, like all these things were such bullshit, I couldn't stand it. So we're like, we're going to do something different. So we built the largest digital financial network in the world. Think or so. I'm sorry, Tasty Trade. Awesome. Let's, yeah. I just want to touch on that a little bit more. So when you say that these financial media, like you didn't like him, you, you thought it were BS, yeah. like what stuck out to you as BS? Just for listeners who are kind of new, they can sniff it, it's it out. It's mostly, it's, it's not, it's, it's the message they give. Like, like I honestly don't care. Like it's all guests giving their opinion. I see. And it's hosts giving their opinion. I don't care what somebody's like. You're a trader, you know. It, somebody's opinion is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a stupid opinion. Like it doesn't mean anything. It, doesn't, it actually doesn't help you get better at trading or make you money or build wealth or teach you anything. It's just an opinion, you know. And listening to one opinion after the next opinion, it's not. That's not content to me. So we decided we're going to build a think tank and deliver quantitative, strategic content all from data scientists and physicists, yeah, and mathematicians, right. and no news, no technical analysis, no, um, you know, no guess. And they, everybody said we're insane. And we pulled it off. Yeah, I see what you mean. So it's like, I look at Jim Cramer, he gives me his opinion on stocks. I go to your channel, you explain to me jump diffusion models. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's I mean, we knew, skill. we knew we were going for a tiny, like, we knew we were going after like this little niche marketplace. Like it, we were not under some um, crazy idea that we were going to capture the whole world. But we also know that that our customers and our marketplace is is infinitely more valuable than anything else out there. And so um, we just didn't know if we could pull off. You know, we're eleven years into Tasty, but we just sold the company for one point one billion. So we we just sold it, but we're still there. But we didn't know if it would work, and we didn't know that we'd still be doing the same thing 11 years later. Like we hired comedians, we had this grand plan, all this crap. You know, we thought we had this crazy ideas, but you figure it all out. You know? Yeah. Well, congrats on selling, but also you have like this cult following at Tasty, and yeah. is that because you know listeners learn from you, and now there's like this connection? It's also pretty genuine. Like we're, you know, you know, we've built relationships with hundreds of thousands of people, and it's pretty genuine. Like. You know, I still answer, basically my whole life is just answering customer emails. That's my entire life. Yeah. Like, I mean, you could say that's, that's kind of depressing, but the other side to it is it's kind of cool. And, um, you know, we build all our own technology. Um, we build crazy amount of technology, you know, in, we build most of it in house in Chicago. We build some overseas. Um, but you know, um, we buy and sell companies. We do all this stuff. It's fun. Like I only do things that are fun and tasty is really fun. Awesome. So the trans. So at first you couldn't start a brokerage because you didn't want to compete. When when were you able to make that tr transition so, to have? So it's brokerage? a good story. So we started Tasty and then Tasty Trade, 2011. We launched it. 
we started like 2010, but then we, we finally launched it in 2000, summer of 2011. And we cut a deal with TD because they were an investor. Um, we tried a bunch of different things. Then we cut a deal with them. It was a five-year deal. And the deal said, we'll, we'll send you the customers that we get at Tasty, and you'll pay us X amount of money. And we were both happy. We had a profitable model. We were making money from day one. Everything was great. When the five years came up, um, we went back to TD and say, we said, um, you know, what do you want to do? And they were like, uh, we want to buy you guys. Mm. So they offered us a couple hundred million dollars for Tasty. And we're like, all right, if you guys are offering us like a couple hundred million dollars for this thing we built, then we must be worth triple that. <laughs> like that's still just something that went through our heads. So we sat around. Now we had the same team, myself, Scott, Christy Ross, Woody Ma, there's the same team that built Thinkorswim. So we've all been together now for 17, 18 years. And we sat in a room and we just said, you know, if these guys are trying to buy us, we, we must be worth so much to them because they don't buy anything, like anything. They, don't, they never make an offer that's reasonable. So we politely declined. We said, listen, it's been great working with you, but we're going to do it ourselves. And we decided to build another platform. We built Tastyworks. We had no more non-competes or anything like that. Oh, that's and, fantastic. And they go, you're never going to make it again. You know, blah, blah, blah. We're like, okay, we'll see. And we launched Tastyworks, and it's been crazy successful. That's fantastic. And it, one of the things that is a good highlight of your, of your brokerage is the middle, middleware kind of built by high frequency. Um, really yeah, good execution. Yeah, we, we partner with a um, high frequency firm in Chicago, Simplex. I don't know if you know those guys. Um, but they're one of the best high frequency firms in the world. Um, we partnered with them. They were, they were an early investor in both Thinkorswim and tasty um we started with their essentially with their middleware piece our front end our back end their middleware and um we've since kind of you know we've grown out of it um but it's we have pretty much the only high frequency platform and it's really stable we've had like virtually zero downtime in five years nice. so um we've built this fast stable platform that that supports any strategy and any product it's kind of cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment just, you know, in a retail world, there's this new pay for order flow model and people could do, you know, no, no uh, commissions for trades. Now, I know you guys have Doe, which is kind of like the Robin Hood competitor. We, we, we essentially shut Doe down. We're, we're going to relaunch it, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to look very different. Oh, interesting. Yes. And can you comment on that real so quick? So we are going after Robin Hood and Webull and all the free apps, but next year. Awesome. And and is that going to be a similar sort of pay for order flow model or how? how when you do say you, pay for order flow, so you mean we're going to, we're going to collect money from order flow? So like Citadel pays for sure. client order flow sure. of Robinhood and now Robinhood sure. offers commission free trades. Well, the fact that they offer commission free trades, you know, that doesn't mean anything to me because everybody routes orders the same way. So there is no such thing. Like when you say pay for order flow, there is nobody that doesn't get paid for order flow. Every, everything except futures orders. Is paid is paid for. There is no no firm, whether it's Fidelity, E Trade, Ameritrade, Schwab. It doesn't matter who the firm is. Interactive brokers. Everybody gets paid for order flow. Mm -hmm. There is nobody that doesn't because it's the only way you can basically route orders. The exchanges. You got to understand how order flow works. The exchanges are incompetent, flat out. The exchanges, by the nature of their technology and their legacy technology and their the way they operate, they are not capable of making efficient markets. Hmm. It's just, they're just not capable of handling the water flow, they're not capable of making efficient markets. So what happens is all these high frequency firms step in between. The payment game is essentially, um, since we get paid for order flow, we're able to um, create a competitive market in basically three to five milliseconds. So we're able to, to create this competitive marketplace among all our liquidity providers. We're able to reduce the cost to our customers we're able to improve the quality of our fills dramatically, and we have also firms that will answer to us if there's a bad fill. So, so all those things are impossible on the exchange level. Mm -hmm. And then we let them take all the bad orders, we let them route everything to the different exchanges, we let them figure out where they want the flow to go. It's, it's clean, it's 100 times more efficient, the system works amazing, and I don't think they'll ever change it. If anything, I expect payment to go significantly higher. I hope that they start to offer payment on the futures business too, and eventually it'll be on the crypto business and everything else. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. The, the system works with payment. The system without payment does not work. 
Yeah, okay. And so maybe you just can touch on this because I'm not sure I completely understand. So for like Robin's Hood's execution versus Tasty's ex execution, where is the difference? Is it just the infrastructure, like how it's built, the fact that you built it with Simplex? Is that the main difference? Yeah, forget about the Simplex thing. That's just, that, that's already, you know, that's already embedded in the thing. The, the, there's, there's no difference, and I'm saying this on a general level, mm -hmm. there's no difference between how any firm in the entire industry that has, you know, at least it's been built in the last 20 years or something, but there's no difference on how any firm routes orders. Every firm, like if we write an order to Citadel and Robinhood routes an order to Citadel or TD routes an order to Citadel, it's all the same. Now, the firms, they, they technically can require, you know, like we, we will monitor, like I don't know how closely firms like Robinhood will monitor what Citadel does or how, how closely they'll monitor what, you know, what some other high frequency uh, market making firm does. We monitor the fill rates, we monitor the fill prices, we monitor everything. If we think one firm is a little bit wide or not doing as mm -hmm. well as they should, we just, we let them know and we flip to another firm. You know, and we flip the we just flip the best ex, ex order execution engine. I don't know how closely Robinhood follows that stuff. I don't know anything about their order routing mechanisms, but generally speaking, there is no difference in any firm except speed. So the difference that Tasty is we're faster, but there's absolutely no difference in the in the way we route orders into the way anybody else routes orders, and every firm does it the same way. That makes sense. So just last point before we move on from this. When you say we're faster, why is it that you're faster? Just newer. Just newer. Just better tech. Better tech. Got it. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Newer, better tech. Less less um, less legacy technology clogging up the middleware piece. That makes sense. I see. Cool. Now, one of the things that I really like about your platform is you and, and your media company is you advocate for people basically, you know, trading their own funds or being custodians sure. and not being passive investors. Sure. You know, wh where did that philosophy come from? And it's been our philosophy from the day we got in this business. We've been, we've been at, we have been advocates for the do-it-yourself investor, for the self-directed investor, from day one. We have been anti. We have been the most vocal firm in the world with respect to managing your own money. And here, the problem is that there is no nowhere in life would everybody would ever. Would anybody ever say to you, you know what, you should be passive. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's no part of your life where you really want to be passive. And yet when it comes to investing, we tell people, yeah, you should be passive. You know, we want you to be crazy successful, we want you to do all this crazy stuff, but we want you to be passive. Who wants to be passive? Um, the problem I have with passive investing is you learn nothing. You you close your eyes when you're 24, 25 years old and you wake up one day and you're 55. Mm -hmm. And you're like, where the fuck did my life go? And I don't know, I don't know anything. And I didn't learn anything in the process. I gave my money to some idiot broker at Merrill Lynch or something like that. And, and you know what? 30 years later, I got a little more than I started with. He got 40% of it, mm. but the firm got 40% of it. I got like something, but who cares? I didn't learn anything. I don't know anything. Now I'm 55 and I don't want to take as much risk. Like I encourage everybody who's 22, 21, 20, you know, like we're building new technology now, which is all for just to get people to speculate because Everybody should risk everything they've got at 20, 21, 22, 25. Who cares? Yeah, it's the time to take risk. Sure, of course. And now, to me, that makes a lot of sense because I'm a trader and I love trading, sure. so that, that resonates with me. Now, do I? what about someone who's not obsessed with trading? Can they still do it? Sure. They can still be successful? Because it doesn't matter if you're successful. It doesn't matter if you lose everything. Because what happens is when you go through a process of assessing risk and taking risk, and, and if you believe in, you know, like I'm an efficient market theorist, efficient market person. So I believe markets are always fair. So nobody has any edge. And if you, if you just do something a number of times, like you end up with this, with a skill set that's very different than the skill set you started with when you didn't do something a number of times. Mm -hmm. Like anybody does something in some form of repetitive fashion, just does something. You you improve the speed at which your brain makes decisions, which will help you in everything else you do. So I don't care about, you know, somebody opens an account with, you know, $2,000 and is 22 years old and loses all their money and is totally bummed out. Who cares? If you made 100 trades in the process of losing that $2,000, you're going to be infinitely better off for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
and or, or you would just go to Vegas and blow the two thousand dollars anyway. So who cares? But you're going. Your brain is going to work so much differently. Like ten decisions changes the changes the 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 way your brain operates and the speed at which your brain operates it, to almost an exponential number. If you make thousands of decisions, it puts you in a different level. It's like really great athletes, like really great quarterbacks and really great athletes aren't physically that much different. You know, like the Tom Brady's of the world. They're not physically, or the Peyton Manning's, weren't that much, they weren't physically gifted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Their brains just work faster. Mm. And, and that's why they are great. You know, that's why they're superstars. Um, some people are physically gifted, like the Michael Jordans of the world, but that they're few and far between. So I guess what someone might use as a counter argument is that, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. If I'm spending my time trading, you know, maybe I could get that same experience being an entrepreneur. Maybe, maybe I you can. Get that same experience. Or maybe you can. Kick flipping. Who cares? Rails. So yeah. you're just saying, like, take the risk on anything sure. in life. Sure. It's more of a do whatever. Do whatever turns you on. Do whatever you're passionate about. I don't care. You know, it doesn't have to be trading. The only the thing with trading is that it's the only efficient marketplace. Like, what are you going to do to go make? You know, you can't buy and sell these balls. You know, because there's, there's no market for it. Sure. So, you, so what are you going to do? Like, you know, there's nothing to do there. You know, you can't buy and sell this phone because right. there's no market for it. Totally. So, so, so you can buy it once, but you can't sell it. There's no, you know, you can't. The spread's too big. So you got to find something that you can actually create that kind of, you know, competition or that kind of marketplace, and it just doesn't exist. Yeah, there's good feedback in the trading. Yeah, you can't even do it in like at a poker table. You know, that's why poker players are relatively unsuccessful, even though they do take risk, is because they're they don't understand the negative edge that goes into you know, from the house raking or whatever else it is. Yeah. yeah, so you have to be, yeah, you have to be somewhere. I don't care if it's a zero sum game, but you have to be somewhere where it's a level playing field. And I don't know of any other ones there are. That's interesting. And then, so one of the arguments that we would hear, kind of out there in mainstream media, is something like, you know, while people have experience with degrees and all that stuff, and you know, maybe they're better at managing your index fund or whatever it is. Now, I don't really believe that argument because if we look at like long-term capital management, not those, a chance, no. those are the smartest guys, but they're the ones sure. blowing up. Sure, not so, a chance. So kind of extending that argument, what really gets me excited in jazz about crypto, it's, it's almost the same thing. You know, the fiat system, in my mind, you have the Federal Reserve, they are the LTCM of the monetary policy. Okay. And crypto is essentially like individuals essentially taking decisions and custodying themselves. Have you started looking into crypto personally? Is that sure. an environment? I, trade crypto. I, I actively trade crypto. I mean, my crypto position right now is a little smaller than it's been in the past, but I actively trade probably like five to five to seven different digital assets. Um, and I've been trading them for years. Uh, the problem with crypto is, first of all, I, I buy into everything you just said, and I believe in you know, a tokenized economy in the mm -hmm. future. I believe in a digital ecosystem. I believe in Web3. Um, we're making our largest capital investment ever right now, technology-wise, into, you know, um, a crypto stack where all this crazy technology we're building right now, you know, essentially um, from our own blockchain all the way up to other things, okay, tons of stuff. That said, the problem with crypto from a trader standpoint is it's a very one-dimensional product right now because there's no regulatory clarity. Mm -hmm. And until there's regulatory clarity in the US, um, it's never going to be a viable product. Now, I don't, under, I don't know why it's taken the regulators so long, but we need regulatory clarity because until the major firms that have the capital, which is you know the financial service firms, and they can open up that to retail investors, and there's also a way to um, create a derivatives marketplace which allows you to reduce basis. So like, if I'm going to be long Bitcoin or I'm going to be long Ether, whatever it is, I want to sell some upside calls against it to reduce my basis because right now I can't even short them. If I, like, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. Like I can't buy one and sell the other. Mm -hmm. I can't. Who cares what the vol is? You know, there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, the option marketplace just doesn't trade and it's not an efficient, capital efficient marketplace when you have to pay cash for something. So right now we're in a cash only market with no shorting and no derivatives. It's a shitty marketplace for customers. All it is right now is just a place where you can learn how to, you know, buy something and when it goes down you can buy more. When it goes up you can sell a little bit out. That's all you can do. 
And again, it's it's from a brokerage standpoint, from us, there there's no leverage, so there's no borrowing, there's no money in it because nobody can really trade it. There's no derivatives. It's capital inefficient. You know, we offer it as a as a just as you know, we want you to come so because we want to offer everything in one place. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's an inefficient. Um, it's an inefficient marketplace compared to, you know, I mean, the, the spreads are tight, but it's an inefficient marketplace compared to all other listed financial products. We need regulatory clarity to clean everything up, and then I say, think the business will explode. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think your perspective makes a lot of sense here in the U.S. I think globally, we have awesome exchanges like Deribit. We have, yeah, we have Globally, it doesn't matter because the world, and, and I don't want to sound ethnocentric or anything like that, but global doesn't make a dent. If you don't... 80% of everything that's traded globally is traded here in the U.S. If you don't have it in the U.S. marketplace where it's the deepest pool of liquidity, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the problem. If you can't, if you don't have U.S. regulators doing it, everybody else holds off. Like, so most marketplaces around the world, you know, nobody's gone there yet. Yeah, to your point, I mean, world reserve currency, U.S. dollar, most cryptos priced in U.S. dollars. I, I get that point for sure. So kind of what we're seeing... Here at GVOL, we look at DeFi markets, we look sure. at some of the listed options markets like Deribit. You know, we see some pretty interesting stuff going on in the DeFi options space. Is there anything in, in DeFi, I know that's nascent, I, th I know that's wide, I know that's for yeah. the most part unlevered. Is yeah. there anything that you find interesting in, in that space? Um, we're really limited because we're highly regulated. So um, by, you know, CFTC, by FINRA, SEC. So. There's a lot of things that we find interesting. There's very little we can actually do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because we can't cross that line, nor do we want to draw attention. We don't make enough money from it to even for it to be worth our while to even take that chance. Right. So like risk is a cool thing, but you can't do things that don't make any sense. Like you can't bring the regulators into your conference room and right. you know, say, what are you guys doing? So we're very careful about playing by the, the rules and um, you know we're really limited as to what we can do. Now the good part about that is we didn't get caught in any of this mess. You know we didn't mm -hmm. lose anything on any of these companies that have collapsed. We haven't, you know, even started to offer staking yet. In you know mm -hmm. even though we will. And so so we've been very careful about you know what we offer, what we can offer. Um, do we see the potential? Sure. We've talked to lots of firms that make markets in, you know, um, in in. Bitcoin derivatives, but we can't go there yet. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Yeah. So just wrapping up here, I think a couple of fun questions to close sure. out. So question number one, what is your favorite Chicago neighborhood? Well, I actually live in the same neighborhood that you're filming this thing. So, I mean, I guess this is my favorite neighborhood. I mean, you know, I, where you, I, I would think where you live is your favorite, I think. Love so, it. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And then this is Ravenswood for whoever's yeah. wondering. And then, um, is the Sawstop family all options traders? Um, no, um, not at all. <laughs> my mom was an art teacher. Um, my father was a civil rights attorney. My sisters and brothers are lawyers. Um, my daughter works with us. Cool. And my son works for a startup in Chicago that's in the entertainment technology business. So, so no, it's just... Um, just my daughter, but she's not really a trader. She's a compliance officer. <laughs> cool. Um, but uh, but we're in the business. You know, we work together, which is great. Awesome. And then last question here: outside of trading, you know, what do you do for fun? What is kind of the so I am I am um, hobbyless. Um, I mean, I have a life, but it's um, I don't really do anything. Like I mean, I'm literally hobbyless. Uh, but I have a pretty full life. I'm I I'm, I'm kind of a workaholic, so. You know, all I do is really work, but but I travel a ton for work. We do shows all over the country. We we're always promoting our products and our businesses, and and I like that. That's part of my life. And um, uh, I, I'm pretty busy, so I stay busy. You know, and I'm at the point in my life where, like I said, I only do things that are fun for me. Yeah. So so that's kind of my hobby. Cool. You know, I, I guess. Love it. I don't well, know. Tom, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Everyone, thank you for tuning into the Gmail Podcast. Thanks again. Thanks.